By way of introduction, um, I know Dan McDowell, Watson Chapter International Treasurer. Um, Ron likes to abbreviate his title to Hidge, and then I realized my title would be Hid, which sounds a little off-putting. Um, I was uh, I started my career at uh, Ernest & Young as a tax consultant, and I can't type and talk at the same time. Uh, I moved, uh, thanks to Starbucks, actually there was less and less of the planning and, um, and consulting work, so I asked to compare high net worth 1040s, and uh, I got to see um, a lot of very interesting things when I did them. I got to really see what wealthy looks like, and I can tell you it's not what people tell you it looks like. Uh, in a lot of cases, they didn't get wealthy on these perfectly balanced, uh, frequently rebalanced, uh, precision invested portfolios. Um, it's it's a totally different animal. I can also tell you the big knock on them is you know they should give a lot more back. They gave a lot. They gave a lot to couldn't take deductions on. Uh, that was very interesting to me. So beyond that, we'll leave it alone. From there, I moved to a smaller firm, and then I decided to get into wealth management. I went to a bank as a vice president and relationship manager. In the spring of 2008, if you know what happened then, you understand why sometimes I call myself the angel of death. Because uh, I got into banking in 08, and I got into accounting right before Enron in the big four. So um, what I saw was very interesting. Um, what I learned helped me understand exactly what the industry is about, and I'm going to hopefully walk you through a number of those things so you can better understand when somebody presents themselves as a financial advisor, what they are and are not, and how you find the people that you should talk to. Does this make sense so far? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the esoteric stuff I was talking about in the last session uh, revolves around uh, a lot of research that has been distilled into some fabulous books about they're calling me adaptive subconscious. Uh, if you look at the human mind, and I'm gonna boil this down, if you look at the human mind, the conscious mind should not be able to react to hitting a baseball, it can't, it's too slow. So the question is, what is it that can hit in, in you know, professional baseball players or golfers or whomever it is, what is it in their brains that enables them to do that thing that their conscious mind isn't able to do? It's what they call the adaptive subconscious, which is trained through repetition. It's very fascinating. I think it has a lot of applicability to everything in life, including how you manage your finances, because you need to force yourself in the beginning to do some things, not white knuckle discipline, but into some patterns. And those patterns will begin to dictate your behavior, and I think that will be very helpful to you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Probably more so than the last group. So, uh, all we really have is time. I was listening to a podcast recently, and the individual said, yeah, I can get, he was an entrepreneur, he said, I can make 500 bucks back. I can't get 15 minutes back. And that's the truth. Essentially, what we're doing here is trying to figure out how to sell as little time for as much money as possible. And unless we're independently wealthy, we're really trying to figure out how it is we purchase the rest of our life back. And that sounds a little, you know, it's a little off-putting in the beginning, um, but it's best to start thinking about that because none of us are guaranteed the next 30 years. And in a lot of ways, I just do not agree with the idea that you should work yourself to the bone until you're 65 and then, oh yeah, then you can enjoy life. Just don't buy it. Uh, all right, financial independence start with your thought process. So we, so we go out and start killing deer and raising crops, we're gonna need money. But how we handle money affects our health. Um, and a lot of this stuff, a lot of the research on stress is very fascinating and the biological responses to it. To kind of sum it up, essentially our bodies are still evolutionary, like, you know, we're, we're a blip away from the last time we were actually hunting and gathering. We are designed to respond to stressful stimuli that are short-lived. We didn't get eaten by the animal. We survived the fight, we survived the storm, we didn't drown, we didn't freeze to death. These stressors come and they go away. The ones we deal with now do not go away. They are perpetual and they are not of the nature that the body is designed to deal with. So we create chronic stress, which messes with hormone levels, which puts you in a state where it's very difficult to be disciplined. In short, what am I saying? It's not a victim mentality, but in a lot of ways it may not be your fault until you're cognizant of why you're making certain decisions that you're making. 
And I think it's helpful to understand the amount of biology that's driving a lot of the decisions that we have, that we make. Um, this, I'm sorry. I have a standing desk at work, so I kind of uh, need exit from this because I did it last time to go over So, um, one of the things I want to talk about is the emotional pendulum. There are certain people on television who will scream at you as though they're your mother about whether you should buy something or not. I think we all know who they are. Um, so studies were done on individuals who had brain damage that had no emotional component to their daily operations and found them unable to make even the simplest of decisions. So emotion is a very important component of almost every decision that we make. And yes, I'm oversimplifying, but that is the gist. So when you tie that kind of intense emotion to financial decision making and you make a sale of a book or a program, that person that sells that benefits and you are still in that feedback loop of emotion and nobody really gets that much better other than the person that sold the book. So how we handle our stress, uh, so why am I saying this? I'm trying to explain why, if you say, Dan, well, there's an awful lot of emotion, there's an awful lot of, when you read some of these books, there's a lot built in, you know, they seem to be trying, but they call it bringing it down to a human level, I call it a sales pitch. So that's why I'm saying this, because I want you to understand the spectrum of emotion. When I'm dealing with my money, and when I'm really trying to do the right things to get better, why is it what I've been doing new today hasn't worked so far? Is everybody still with me? Am I losing anybody? Yeah. Okay, a little bit in the back. Uh, and emotional pendulum economic decisions are, you buy something you shouldn't buy, you beat yourself up. You buy something you should do, something you shouldn't do, you beat yourself up. I beat myself up a lot. I haven't gotten any richer because of it. Or So I get off of that. I want you to start looking at things analytical. You're in law school, you should be able to do that. So that's kind of where we're going to go with it. Um, morality, you know, we talked about it. I like to talk about this in the sake of biblical interpretation. Everybody's familiar with the camel and the eye, the needle and the rich man. Yes, no. I'm gonna oversimplify it. It was the statement I believe was loosely translated to, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of the needle, the eye of the needle, I believe, than it is for a rich man to go to heaven. Problem is we don't know what the eye of the needle is. There is some question of interpretation as to whether it is the eye of the needle or a hole in the wall of the city that the camel could actually get through. So we like to throw around a lot of things that we don't really understand when it comes to being wealthy. I throw that out there because being wealthy seems to be demonized and I don't believe that it should be. And so to take that emotional onus off of the idea that it's not bad for me to want to be wealthy, that's not an issue. It doesn't change the kind of person that I am because I want to be that. I don't have to be a good person or a wealthy person. I can tell you I know a lot of them who are both. So I want to kind of, I like to address that. It's minimal, but it's important to me. As we said, no one needs a beating unless money's going to fly out of your nose. Uh, you can't fight human nature. You can train yourself. Subconscious doesn't process negatives. Okay, if I'm sitting here going, God, I really don't want to be in debt. I don't want to be in debt. Debt is bad. Debt, bad debt. I don't want to be in debt. I'm not going to be in debt. You're really only visualizing debt. Oh, Dan, are you jumping into that whole secret movement where you attract the things into your life that you think about? Not really, but remember we're talking about the adaptive subconscious that is driven by your habits. If your habit is constantly to think about the, all the debt you could get into, you are in a way programming yourself to focus on that. It is not mystical. It is merely you become what you think a lot about because you're thinking about it a lot. Uh, let's see. So when you say not, I get back to my point. The, the mind doesn't think in words, so it's not like a programming language. So if I say don't, I don't want to be in debt, the, the mind doesn't program that way. So it, it, it's just, you have to think more directly and specifically about the goals that you're going to have. Uh, now on fire, no such thing as top of the train. Okay, I'm going to skip through these. Um, oh, this one I'm not going to skip through. Can anybody see the movie Red Belt? No, fantastic movie if you're a David Memon fan. Uh, the, the, main, the main instructor is a jiu-jitsu instructor, and he says everything's got to force you to embrace or deflect it by opposing. Anybody in here have a lot of experience with saying you're not gonna do something and then doing it anyway. I mean, it's just, yeah, no, yeah, no. She, Jen never does that. Jen's a part of it. I need you to be brutally honest with yourself. And why do I say that? Uh, a number of years ago, I read a book called 
uh, Confessions of a Street Addict by Jim Cramer. Does everybody know who Jim Cramer is? Mm -hmm. He's a guy on CNBC, for those of you who don't, who does stock picking. He's the one that has all the buttons that make all the noise. Um, he talked about how they, he used to keep a stack of keyboards in his back room because he'd smash four or five of them a day because he'd get so angry. He also talked about how he threw water bottles at his assistant routinely. This is this I remember. But the interesting thing was this may not have been his assistant, but one of the people on top. But the interesting thing was he was brutally honest to himself about the kind of person he was, and that enabled him to make the decision to get out of business when he did. Uh, and, I, and the one thing you all need to do is be that honest with yourself about your particular financial situation and the things that you do. You don't have to tell anybody. This is only with you, but until you tell, until you're honest with yourself about it, then we're never really going to get anywhere. And, and it sounds like a cliche, but it's just, it's important that there's no grand confession that ever has to come out of this. It's just a starting point, but you have to have a clear starting point. Does this make sense? Okay, you're all being turned into a very powerful analytical framework. I would like you to start applying that to what you're doing here. Think of yourself as the client. Uh, my friend Gary talks about stepping outside the situation and saying, all right, if a client came to me with the same things that I'm struggling with, what would I tell them? In a lot of cases, you're going to say, well, I guess it would be a little different than the things I'm thinking about. And I'd like you to start thinking about it that way. Use the tools you've been given. Talk to people you trust. Now, this is... This was kind of, uh, this is a big uh, discovery for me over the past few years and talking to a lot of people that, you know, I wanted to be like. I thought they had gotten where they got in a certain way. I had no idea how circuitous and difficult the route was to get to the place that they are. Uh, in certain situations, it was entrepreneurs who had bought businesses that were guaranteed, I mean, they, they had made every right decision and were still, you know, declared bankrupt, or one example of a person I met, you know, he left the job and kept the company open because he wanted to pay everybody back, so he took the, took the money from the one company to pay everybody back you know, properly. It was no impropriety, but it was him saying, I owe that money, I'm gonna pay it back. Uh, strength of character there speaks volumes, but the point is, you don't have to tell them why you're struggling. This isn't saying, oh, take what you just came up with in the last slide and tell them how bad things are. Ask them about it. A lot of people that you respect will be willing to tell you about how they got where they got, even financially in a lot of ways. And you will be very surprised at the number of people who were living paycheck to paycheck at a certain point who aren't now. It's very important to get their perspective. One of the other important things, uh, everybody's got a thing, and I don't know quite how to describe it. it it's a lot of the, so there's this misnomer when you talk about Warren Buffett. Oh, well, you know, he drives a used car. Um, he's living in the same house he's been living in for 30 years. Well, yeah, at the time, that was a pretty big house. It's got a, it's got a racquetball court attached to it. It's a large house. <laughs> he drives a used car because most of the time he's driving it from the office to the Gulf Stream. He wears $15,000 suits. So when we say, well, look at him, that's what you want to be like, that kind of frugality, it's not really accurate in a lot of cases. Everybody's got their level of materiality. A $15,000 suit is a $150 suit to you. And so I don't, I don't find those examples particularly helpful. So what I found is that most of the people, though, that I knew who were extremely wealthy all had something. You know, one guy wears the cheapest watch I've ever seen. I mean, I'm okay with wearing a cheap wristwatch, but it's one of those ones that breaks. I'm like, don't you need to know when you need to be at meetings and things? It was just so strange. And little things like that that, that, were, that were inconsistent with the level of wealth they had that I would find inconvenient, which is, you know, again, a value judgment by me <coughs> that they did. But then they'd fly down to the Masters on their private jet with four people in it. You know, there's $200,000 blown out the window, but they knew what they liked. And what you're gonna find is as you go through this process and you remove these things that you don't need, what you're gonna start discovering are the things that you really actually want and the things you can live without. And that's where it gets to a point where it becomes fun because now you're finding, oh, I, I, I don't have to spend this money. It's not, oh, I can't spend this money. It's, oh, I don't have to. I'm gonna take this $250 here and stick it in a bank. Uh, and I'm gonna to go to my favorite place in the world is Bam Springs in Canada, in the, in the Rockies. You know, my thought process is, oh, I don't have to spend that. That goes right in the Canada Fund. You know, find these things in life that charge you up. It's trips, even if it's, you know, I really like 
Uh, I like watches. I do. It's a goofy thing. You know, I, I don't care who knows what it is that I'm wearing. I like it. If I was alone in a room, I would still be fascinated by the device. It's something in me, I don't know. It's just something about something that intricate that fascinates me. If that's what it is for you, and it's really something that's not about somebody else, that's wonderful. Find those things, because that's what gets you there. I'm telling you that's what I see in the people who are first generation wealthy, is they make value judgments about. Even though they could spend, they could buy everything in sight, they realize it's just gonna fill my house and one more thing I gotta deal with. So as we go through this process, you're gonna start to find the things you really want and this will help you get there. Because we may not be able to retire in 10 years, but we may be able to take the trips we want. We may not be deferring all the fun that we wanna have, and that's really what this is about. 2008 taught us the value of thinking like everybody else. I heard in 2008 a lot, hey Dan, you just don't get it. Well, I'm pretty sure I got it, and I'm pretty sure a lot of people didn't. If you're gonna think like everybody else, you're not gonna to get to where you need, and a lot of this is about understanding your personal, oper for lack of a better term, your operating system faults right now in fixing them. So I've kind of, I've gone through a lot of this. So this is an important question. I know a lot of people who are making a lot of money but if they lost their job tomorrow, they would be more broke than the homeless person that you see on the street. Why is that? Because they're income wealthy. They're not balance sheet wealthy. They own, they own a lot of things. They don't really own much. You know, it's a $10 million house, but they're paying. They got to jump a mortgage on it. It's a new Mercedes, but they're, you know, they're still paying for that Mercedes. Um, this is not a generalized statement about people that own those things who are apparently wealthy. This is just a certain subset more than you would think who are income stable and wealthy. They really are not. They don't have that much cash in the bank. The reality is wealth is how long you can live without a paycheck. And that's what we're trying to get to here. Um, we get, but we get sold on this, you know, get the big job, and then we find that, you know, we're, we're working so much that we're buying certain things to offset other particular ineffectiveness things in our lives, and we get caught up in this cycle. So it's, it's very easy to get caught in this, I just want more income, when, you know, you really want just more savings from the income that you have. Look at your income as a lever to get to these things. Uh, I've been laid off twice. Uh -huh. So, I, I almost, I don't expect stability in a job anymore. So I, to my mind, income can be taken away from me at any time. How much I spend, with certain exceptions, I can control 80% of it. You know, a lot of stuff, emergencies, you might, you know, just, the acts of God, whatever, but I can control most of it. All right, uh, where are we? Okay, I wanna run through $100,000 salary. Uh, which is a nice gig if you're just getting out. I know 160 is out there plus a bonus, but it's pretty scarce these days. Um, $100,000 would probably be okay with everybody. Yes. Anybody saying, I need 100, 250, what are you kidding me? <laughs> um, so, after, I'm going to just skip the numbers here, but let's talk about what you buy. You buy a BMW because that's what lawyers drive. <laughs> um, I think it was a couple of years ago, it was $36,000, and I just took the base model. And uh, this might be the two series now, but you know, it doesn't have the leather because the leather's another 1900, so it's the leatherette, I'm sorry. Uh, 36,000, 1.9% five years, including delivery of 5% tax. Now what you're gonna see in this is that, if you look at the last slide, I took a 3% rate, those of you in more progressive states are saying, boy, that's really low. The assumptions I make in this slide are designed to give you the benefit of the doubt and be low to show you just where this goes. So just follow me through here. Uh, car, rent utilities, 1500 bucks, yeah, right? Not Los Angeles, it's New York City, but again, let's just assume that. Uh, student loan debt, some of you may really laugh at this one, I put 100 grand in there at 8%. I understand the rates are vacillating between six and eight, so we're still kind of in the ballpark there, so eight's probably a safe assumption. 10 year repayment extended to 12 years. I'm sorry, I'm standing right in front of you guys. Um, $100,000, 10 years, you know. But if you extend it, uh, you'll be at 1083. But why do I put that out there? I'm just showing you that, that extra two years, it's less than $200 difference. But we're going to talk about this a little bit later. Um, parking in your transit fees, I said 120. That could be anything. Uh, in Pittsburgh, pretty much you're paying to park anywhere in town. We have the highest taxes on parking anywhere, which makes um, coffee and lunches, that's 750 a day. 
I understand that's going on in New York, the first latte that you have. So again, low estimates. Uh, groceries, anybody here have a Whole Foods near them? You walk in, you walk out, you spend 75 bucks, you get that little bag. <laughs> I just walked out with a bag. And yes, um, the reason I say that is because of the amount of hours you will probably be working, you will probably not be the person who puts the list together in the week, goes after you've eaten a really nice lunch, and buys all the things that only you should buy for the planned meals that you have because you're going to cook the rest of the week, right? Um, that's 75 bucks a week, that's nothing. Um, I'd say no late night runs all the foods down. Entertainment, 200 bucks. <laughs> That's exactly the response I'm hoping for. That's exactly right. No way. No way. Uh, $50 a week. <laughs> 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 I should get the Denny special. What was it? A couple of years ago, they had that, um, they had that, that deal, and I think it was Applebee's, where you could get two meals for like 19 bucks. And I said something along the lines of, well, um, you not taking a date there, and it's not going to go well. Uh, $180. All right, oil prices and predictability. Um, okay. I'm trying to figure out if I want to get into this now. I might get into it now because it's an important point. I put that up there because humans are innately very poor at predicting things that aren't going to kill them immediately that aren't related to, again, biological experience that the evolution is predictable. Or acts of God. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it, was, it was in our finance committee meeting. It was really kind of weird. Uh, yeah, he's. Uh, I hope that's something they're doing. Um, so uh, again, back to what human beings are designed to predict. There are certain things that biologically our brains were programmed for. One of them was not financial predictions. Uh, there have been a number of studies done that indicate that, and I don't want to, I don't want to oversimplify them, but the, the net result was, if you were to give somebody a certain thought about a certain amount number, and then ask them to predict something totally unrelated, there is a correlation between the first number and the second number, because our mind goes to the number that was most recently thought of. It's really very scary. So we are not designed to predict oil prices. We are not designed to predict stock market prices. We're not designed to forecast these things. So when I did this presentation, the first time in 2006, they were saying right now oil prices should be $250 a barrel. You can imagine what the airline reimbursement would be on that. Uh, but my point is we really don't know. When we talk about predictability, when you start talking to people about you start talking to financial planners and financial managers, you start seeing people with that title. The reality is uh, that that's not a professional designation. There are ways to become that that just require one exam or, and it's not to say it's not a difficult exam, but what I'm trying to emphasize is these are not people who went to school for seven years to get a professional degree that was based on this. They're not, it's not like surgeons, it's not like lawyers, it's, it, it's, it's a designation that anybody can use. And so what you'll find in a lot of cases is they are what I call asset gatherers. So they are salespeople. And they bring you in because they get paid on assets under management, which is money that they, you know, they'll take about 1.2% or more, oddly enough, more as, the, as, the, as you have less money to manage, the rates are generally higher. Um, and you'll find when you talk to them, they will, if you ask specific questions, they'll introduce you to a planner. They'll show you a glossy brochure with their economists and all these other things. And reality is the predictions of economists have been no better. You know, any economist is hit or miss in a lot of cases. So what I'm, I guess what I'm emphasizing here is if human beings by nature are terrible at predicting things, I don't want you to think that your financial success is incumbent upon you going out and finding that perfect financial advisor with that best team of economists, because it's really not out there. I, I want to take that focus off because we seem to be focusing on, well, I have this guy who can do this. And the most important things don't relate to that. Having a good advisor is important, but it's not quite as important at certain stages in your life when we're dealing with these things. Does everybody follow me? Understand? I just, there are people out there with designations like chartered financial analysts. That's a very hard designation to get. Uh, with three exams over three or four years and a wealth of experience. You have CPA, CFPs, uh, I'm sorry, PFS. CPA, PFS, which is a CPA who's had to have 
at least the requirements to get, well, you have to have the license to get it, and you have to have a certain number of hours of planning. And to get a CPA license, you have to have a certain number of hours in accounting. And, and so it's, a, it's built on a knowledge of numbers that has a depth to it. And I would say if you're going to look for people to talk to, I would look at them because they're probably going to bill you by the hour instead of saying, no, I won't charge you money, just let me manage your money. They're taking a piece. There have been articles, and I'll have, if I can find it, I'll have Andrew send it out, where they talk about compounding interest and the net effect of high fees on that and how it just absolutely destroys returns over time. So when you engage a financial advisor, that person is actually taking a chunk of your money. So if they're going to do that, you want to be very careful as to how much they're taking and why they're taking it. Because the reality is they're probably not making you any more money than certain other approaches that could be more cost effective. Everybody see where I'm coming from? Okay. Um, cell phone, $70. Anybody paying 70 bucks? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Credit card debt service, I said 260 bucks, this is 7,500 to be paid off in three years, and this is half the average of $15,000, okay? Um, uh, insurance, PA averages $820 for auto, records $144, health insurance. I try to be careful when I talk about this because I don't want to make it sound like I'm making a political statement because I'm not, I'm making an analytical statement. If you look at the history of health insurance premiums, since the passage of the health care law, they have skyrocketed. There are specific examples in places that you would assume to be more favorable to the particular political persuasion that supported the implementation of this law that are saying, we had no idea the rates were gonna skyrocket. I don't know whose fault. I don't know if that's the law's fault. I don't know if that's something that just was unforeseen. I don't, I don't wanna make a political statement. What I do wanna say is, this is a number that is very difficult to predict right now. And I want you to be cognizant of this is this is a big black hole. Uh, if you if they're if insured, if companies are going to start dropping insurance in favor of the exchanges, it's going to change the nature of compensation fundamentally. So be aware that I'm 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 just throwing this in here, but I really want you to understand that there's there's big variables out there. Uh, so we'll move on here. Total expenditures forty nine seventy total income. 378 bucks. You can invest that 8% for 30 years, you get 563, 355. You can go buy that island now. Uh, if I adjusted for inflation, I'm about $230,000. Safe withdrawal rate, which is high. I don't necessarily agree with it. They say sometimes, don't quote me again, this isn't advice, this is just what I'm remembering, is 4%. 4% uh, on $200,000. Anybody think they can live off of that? It's about 10 grand on 250,000, I think. Okay, why do I bring you to this downer position? Dan, you just gave me this big job and then we spent all this money on this cool stuff and now you're saying I'm not gonna be able to retire. The reason I bring it up is fundamentally I want you to understand that when you look at returns retrospectively, I can do the compounding interest equation and smooth it out and see 8% over time. As we all know from the last 10 years, there is no, there's nothing smooth about how this works. And a lot of the assumptions may not be eight, in a lot of cases you may see 10. You're starting to see six because they're starting to get it. Um, but for a while early, in the early 2000s, you were seeing 8% in that forecasted chart. You were investing $30 and you had $8 billion by the time you retired. Um, I'm, again, I'm being facetious, but understanding that that's kind of the way it's presented to you. Just give me your money and we'll invest it and you'll have more than you ever needed. It's not quite the reality. All right. We can guess the ones we talked about. Uh, so that's 378 bucks that we need to get invested. It's probably going to go to car tires, oil changes, dates, comparison. I'd probably even say you got a job, you can come visit us now. You know. Uh, salary doesn't give you the freedom you seek. It's another relative level of poverty. Did anybody read Liar's Poker? Liar's Poker was a book about investment banking in the 80s written by the same guy who wrote The Big Short, which was about what just happened recently with the the debt crisis. One of the things he said was nobody got rich there. They only achieved other, you know, different levels of relative poverty. So when you had a certain amount of money, suddenly you got into expensive wines, then you got into expensive art, and then you started buying, you know. So what happens is our income goes up, and we expand our consumption to meet that income in a lot of cases where, and I'm going to get a little bit philosophical here, there's a lack of self-actualization. We're working so much that, you know, we're 
in that loop of, you know, I'm, I, I've earned this, I'm doing this, this is going to make me feel better, for lack of a better way to look at it. And it does, but, you know, the car gets dinged and the wine gets drunk and you're still in the same place that you were. This is being human. This is not a failure. Just understand this is kind of a loop we get. All right. So now what happens normally in these presentations, somebody's giving this, they come up with a grand idea. You know, here's how I'm going to sell you on a foolproof, 100% guaranteed way for generating more income than you ever dreamed of from the comfort of your home while spending just minutes a day by your computer in your underwear. <laughs> it's a key statement is it depends on how you look in your underwear. No, I'm just kidding. The point is, there's no shortcuts. But as we talked about, if you stop looking for shortcuts and get 80% of this right, you will get the bulk of the improvements. And you'll be surprised at how many windfalls start appearing as you have cash to take advantage of them and you're in a position where you're not constantly coming back from behind. So that, to me, is more important than suddenly finding the catalyst to make eight million, the, the next app or the next, I can't help this, the next uh, Ninja Blender or something. <laughs> uh, I was gonna say stuffy. My daughters, my daughters, hooked them, they have these, they may have kids in here. Have you seen these stuffies they have? I don't understand. It's just a stuffed animal. It's a bag. But my daughter is fascinated by this, so I'm sure that person's begging a lot. Um, what do you do now? All right, I want you, after sitting around and uh, getting, collecting all of your bills, paying them, paying them, but collecting them all in a pile, and yes, the pile is high, and it's okay. I want you to sit down with a drink, one. Just one, because if you do more than that, you'll wake up in a puddle of your own despair in the morning. <laughs> uh, have that drink and sit down with those bills and get a clear financial picture of where you are right now. It's going to hurt. That's why we have the one drink. Uh, but in all seriousness, you need to know where you are now. And again, no one needs to know where that is except you. Uh, don't carry a credit card balance. Oh, Dan, what are you, my mother? Uh, <laughs> anybody here missed a credit card payment recently? It happens to me once a year at least, because it's just, it's just life happens. And so I call the bank, and this is another thing if you didn't know this, I call the bank and say, hey, I haven't missed a credit card payment in a year. Sorry, I just paid it 15 minutes ago. It's a day late. Can you go on and take the fee off? Yeah, they'll do it. Overdraft fees too, I've, I've argued with them about. You know, I, I, I clearly don't have 500 bucks in that account to give you for the overdraft fees for the $4 coffee that I bought that tripled the rest of it. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'm, I'm fine with agreeing to one. Oddly enough, I've gotten banks to take off all but one, you know, I, or which when you're looking down the barrel of four or five of them is, is a little frightening. That's just a little tip. They have the ability to take those off. They're not mandated by law, no matter what anybody tells you. Uh, so I say this because <laughs> You're talking about 15% or more. 15 is probably a good rate right now. Some of them are ticking up to 18. Uh, nobody's making 18 except, you know, of course, your credit card company. So don't don't pay them. Uh, I mean, no, okay, don't not don't pay them, but don't pay that. You, you understand what I'm saying? Don't get into a position where you have to pay them. Um, let's see here. Track your expenses. I I know I know this seems tedious. Uh, I've been doing it for three years now. Every dollar that goes out, I track on my phone. There's a bunch of apps that are very helpful to do that. The reason I say this is until you know where the money's going out, you are not going to be able to plan. You've got to know where the money's going. And it's every dollar. It's like, oh, that doesn't really count as a dollar. There's five dollars. No. So it's one cent. You put it down. Again, nobody's got to know but you. But you've got to know where the money's going. Uh, we kind of talked about this. What I mean by personal weakness is it's not really a weakness. Um, it's that kind of, it's that thing that they like. And again, this card, think of this card as tracking, as trying to find the money to do the thing that you want to do. You're trying to find where it's going out, so you can stop that and put that money somewhere else. So if you want to put a positive spin on it, that's the positive spin. I'm trying to find the money to do the things that I want, not I'm trying to keep myself from spending money. Again, back to the adaptive subconscious. Give it a goal. The goal is find the money to go on this trip, buy this thing, whatever. Um, not a, it's not a negative. Negative budgeting. Okay, I am. I butcher the story terribly, but as I understand it, Odysseus, when he was sailing, asked his sailors to strap him to the mast and not listen to him and not untie him under any circumstances and to fill their ears with wax as they sailed past the island that had the sirens on it because it would draw them in and they would dash their ships and they'd all be killed. 
what's funny is I think they figured out there were sirens, actually. They were seals, apparently, that they couldn't see, but the sounds were... I think it was very, it was very strange. I didn't see any connection. Anyway, the point is, find ways to put wax in your ears. And that's kind of what we're getting at with behavioral. So as you're tracking these expenses, for example, this has been a rough month because it's convention, you know? So it's expensive in a lot of ways. And so I'm over budget this month. I know I'm over budget. So therefore, this is not going to be the month that, unless I have to, um, you know, I'm going to do certain things because I know where I am. But if I don't know where I am, I don't know whether I should or should not spend certain things I have a amount of discretion over. And, and this starts to say, well, Dan, this is a bit of gamesmanship, right? If you don't do it this month, you're going to do it next month. Hey, guys, this is how business works. You're trying to find cash flow to feed the expenses. The cash flow isn't here this month, don't do it. Do it next month. You know, it, it's, it's just, you now. okay, yeah, if you're running a deficit, that's why you have, you know, your emergency fund and then your savings, and then hopefully you have, as I have, budgeted prospectively for, you know, the airfare. The airfare didn't hit this month, it hit when I bought it in June, it's other things. So you have, you have tried to budget for those things, but at the same time, I know where I am, and I'm making big expenditures this month. Thank God, it's only a few days. <laughs> but, does everybody understand what I'm saying? You need to you need to know because you'll start to forget. You'll think, well, yeah, I, I didn't spend anything big this month. I, I can do this. That's okay. But it's only been two weeks or a week or something. I mean, you, again, concepts of time. It's 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 very it's very difficult to expect yourself to remember exactly when certain things happen. So just don't uh, use something to help you with it. When you graduate, continue on through four, establish an emergency fund. An emergency fund is something that. Essentially, at this point, either you can't get to work or you're living in the same creature comforts as prisons in Siberia. Uh, there's no water because the main broke. There's no heat because the furnace broke. You dropped the transmission. The window was, you know, something happened. It's something that is absolutely an emergency. iPads, iPods, computers, dates, bottles of wine. These are not emergencies, no matter how much we say they are. Um, now, Position yourself realistically by using your resources. Why do I say this? We were talking a little bit earlier. So you have multiple, you can under certain circumstances with certain loans stretch the repayment out over a certain time period. You can also consolidate certain loans and have a lower interest rate and stretch it out over time. If you actually do the math, like if you, so it's similar in some cases to a mortgage, of, which is terrifying because of the amount of money is similar to the amount of the mortgage. The rate's actually more, but if you take that over time and you look at all the interest you're paying, you, in some cases, probably not uncontrollably because it's a massive amount of money. Um, so what does that engender? That engenders that white knuckle discipline that I need to really beat this down. I need to really go after it. I need to be as disciplined as possible and pay it off in 10 years. I agree with you mathematically, but if that means you're saying, yeah, okay, seven days, three meals a day, I can do 18. You know, you're making these extreme sacrifices that you can't comply with for more than short bursts, then I would encourage you to maybe look at another approach. It may be, and again, this is up to you, this is not advice, this has to be your analysis. It may be better for you to take a little bit longer period because you can comply with it. It's more important that you comply with the plan than you have a great plan that someday you'll get to. You follow what I'm saying here? Everybody get this? Okay. Liquidate debt prioritized by interest rate. This is another back of the envelope sketch, right? Uh, my father, my grandfather was in produce. So if your inventory went bad very quickly, it was really, it comes in, goes out. There wasn't a lot of creative financing. You made money or you didn't. I believe a lot of things in life, no matter how complicated people who have a vested interest in advising you on, try to make things, a lot of things in money come simply down to the back of an envelope. So if you're paying 8% on money, you are paying them 8% of that every year. I'm not making anything on that. I've got to liquidate that. A couple of schools of thought. Your mileage may vary. It's up to you as to how you want to do this. If it's going to be a long, sustained effort, you may want to consider taking off some little ones faster. So that list looks shorter, and subconsciously you have some wins, and you can sustain that. Because it's very hard to do a long slog 
of this without some, hey, okay, I got it, no matter how small it is. So you may want to say, yeah, I'm going to take that $300 one and do it now. I'm going to take that $500 one and do it now. Um, and that may not be the highest interest rate, but it may be one of those things that may make you feel better. It's still debt going away. Others may disagree with you. And again, it's up to you individually. Uh, but my feeling is I don't mind those things. 401k options. Anybody in here have an investment that's making more than 50% right now? So I'd really like to talk. Uh, <laughs> this, again, individual situations, I can tell you certain employers will match 50 or 100%. If you're going to get 50% immediately on your money, in a lot of cases, to my mind, it makes sense to take it. You may feel, and it may be better for your individual situation to pay debt with that money instead. However, I would urge you to consider the fact that it's 50% return immediately, or 100% return, and you're not going to make that. Take the free money. Beyond that, it's up to you. A lot of the investments in 401ks are not great, so you may not want to continue to put money into it, but take the free money if it's there. Decide what insurance is right for you. Insurance is... is the good insurance agents that I know are solutions people. They don't look at everything. You know, when you have a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. They are people who understand for this purpose, I, you, know, you should use terms. For this purpose, you need this. They are very smart at the application of insurance. Those are the people you want to talk to. If you need somebody like that, I can get you to somebody because it's very tough to find them. They are very good ones, our technicians. I have one, he calls me once a year, and that's it. It's only because I asked them to call me once a year. And, that, and these are the people you want to be working with. They are, at its, at its level, it is a fabulous tool to take care of certain things. What certain things? You have kids, you're young, you have no money. If something happens to you, your income goes away, you've got to take care of your kids. That's what it's designed for. Estate planning purposes, at the end of life, it may make sense not to use a term. Uh, again, I don't want to get too far into the weeds here, but there are purposes for those product lines, but they are not one size fits all, and you may not necessarily need life insurance or any of those insurance products. Everybody understand what I'm saying? I'm not demonizing, I'm saying look for an application that fits the need. Don't just look for it because people are saying that you need it. Uh, deductibles, riders, regional catastrophes. In my area, we have a lot of mining. Houses have mine subsidence. If you do not have mine subsidence insurance, generally your homeowner's insurance does not cover it. When your foundation cracks in half and half the house shifts, you now own something you can't sell and you have to rebuild on a mine. That's terrifying to me. Understand your region. Is it floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, dragons? I don't know. <laughs> um, but be aware that you may have regional particulars that are not covered by a general homeowner's policy and start looking for them. It's not, you know, we're not demonizing the insurance company. It's a contract. We have contracts with them. They say what they'll cover. They say what they won't. No one's not covered. That's, you know, it can be a contract. Uh, let's see. Oh, another thing. If you have jewelry and stuff like that, I encourage you to look at things. And again, talk to, talk to your agent about it because they're generally pretty helpful on these because they do a lot of them. So that would be one of those ones we'd have a discussion with them. But there are things called... Uh, personal property policies, which used to be called in the marine policies. A lot of us will take jewelry and stuff and put them on the homeowners. As I understand it, again, verify for your particular policy. If you do the homeowners and you have something stolen unrelated to the house, it's a hit against the homeowners, then you have a housing issue, you might get raided on the insurance on the house. So keep them appropriate to the transaction. If it's theft related to an individual piece of property, I want that policy for that. I want the homeowners for the home. Everybody see where I'm coming from? Talk to your agent about it. It's very interesting. And in a lot of cases, they know exactly, oh yeah, it's exactly it. I can set it up very easily. It's fast, uh, fairly cheap, considering. All right, two loans. I'm gonna jump through this a little because there's a lot. There's a lot of things going on with this, but one of the things you're gonna ask me is how do I pay it off faster? How do I not pay it off at all? No, you're not gonna ask the second one, I'm kidding. Um, but what about the loan forgiveness program, governmental loan forgiveness program? As I understand, again, there may be new programs that come out, but as I understand, you could work nine years, 364 days, 24 hours, 0.99 minutes, leave the job and not get the forgiveness. Yeah. Okay, if you want to do the jobs that are related to the forgiveness, God love you, I hope you do it because we need more people to do it. But don't do it just for the forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Now, another caveat. I need to research this. This may not still be accurate. However, there is a question in my mind and in others' minds. If, the, if you do the program and the debt is forgiven, there's cancellation of indebtedness income. 
in the, IR, in the IRC. Does that apply or not? I don't know if that's been addressed. It may have been addressed recently, but be aware there may be some drag on it. I don't think they're going to leave it out there if they haven't addressed it. I just think they have time from when this program went into place until that first batch hits. So they're buying time. They, it's the federal government. They'll probably do something, but be aware that there are other things they may not be talking about. So that's the only other proposition. I'll, if, if anybody has particular questions, I can show you this chart to lead you in a direction to get better information. But there, there, there are different programs, and we've only got a few minutes left. And I am not the guy to tell you about those. People at your school can walk you through them. They are better situated to do it. I would encourage you to have that discussion. But it will always come back down to the basics that we're talking about here. How much interest am I paying? What is my plan? And what are my options? Uh, buying a house. Uh, Valley and Shire is tax tail and the economic dog. The tax tail never wags the economic dog. What does that mean? Anybody in here want to give me a dollar and I'll give you 30 cents back? No. <laughs> I have had people say yes because they think it's a trick question. That is what law school does to you. <laughs> the reality is you're not going to buy a house just to take the deduction. But people seem to say, oh, you get a tax deduction. Okay, great. That's not really why I'm going to buy the house. Um, there's monetary value in renting. There's mobility. There's time. There's you don't have the ants that I discovered in my kitchen. You don't have the little roof that leaks. You don't have all these other things. There is value. If you don't know that it's time to buy, you've got to make the right decision for yourself. Do not accept buying a house as a default wealth management provision. It may not be right. Um, Taxes. I get it. I get it. crying certain areas. I, I, I just, and you have no control over whether what they do. I mean, you have some control. You can vote them out, but the reality is, you you may get a rate increase, you may get a millage increase, you may get a, an assessment increase. You may have no way to fight them, as ridiculous as they are in certain areas. So that's something you get control. That's a big chunk. I don't want to get an extra pay an extra fifteen hundred dollars at the end of the year, but I might have to. Uh, Allegheny County's been a mess on that. I mean. Uh, Margin of safety, again, I like margins of safety. So if you can afford $1,500, I like, you know, I like a 300% cushion. I like tools, I like 20%. You're gonna have to come up with your own cushion, but I advise you very strongly not to go up to that number because you are gonna find ants and holes in the roof and heating systems and all kinds of stuff. Uh, all right, cars, they're consumables, especially if you live where I do, the salt and them. Uh, they get consumed. They consume tires and gas and oil and money and parts and they drive you crazy, right? Uh, cost of maintenance. Um, I know people that own very expensive luxury cars and they're out a couple grand every quarter when they take it in for the scheduled maintenance because you got to do it so you keep the warranty. I don't want that hanging around me. I mean, I had an Acura. I thought I went fairly cheap. And I go to the dealer and I get the bill. I'm like, oh my God, what is it? I mean, it, it, there is a value in driving. There's a great deal of value in driving Fords and stuff like that. Uh, I love Fords, actually. I don't, really like, don't lease. Some of you may want to throw something at me right now. I understand that. You can punch me later. Don't lease. Why do I say that? If you lease, at the end of the lease, you give the car back. You paid a lot of money. Not quite what you would have paid to buy the car, but you have the car. <laughs> you gotta get to work because you gotta pay for the house you just bought. So you gotta buy a car. It's like that old commercial. It's like I, I go to work, so I can do work. Okay, it's like, it's like, it's like you know, it's all it's a circle. Uh, my point is, don't let somebody force you into an economic decision. Make the decision on your own. The least force you into a large economic decision, second largest to the house. And, uh, Used cars, there's great deals of used cars, especially in Lincolns. I know you're all going Lincoln. Okay, yeah, I don't want a Lincoln, I'm not 65 years old. Yeah, give me the both tires while you're at it, too. Uh, there are great deals in that you can find company cars that were Ford executive cars. They've got about 15,000 miles on it. You can pick them up for 50% of the stick. You can get a fully loaded $65,000 Ford MKS for like 35 grand. It's, it's nutty. I'm not saying you should spend 35 grand, but you know, it's, it's 50%. It's fantastic. Um, Okay, choosing a spouse. Boy, I'm really going off the rails here. Um, let me just, let me kind of lay this out very briefly. Um, all right, I'm going to just wait a couple minutes. We'll wrap up here quickly. This is the last slide. 
Uh, it really is the most important choice you make in a lot of ways other than financially. But if I was to come in here and tell you that you should really only marry somebody with a 720 credit score, I would be single right now. <laughs> um, what I am telling you, and this is the mediator in me, and, and you can take this script and I give this to you as my gift. You want to go to that person in a, play, in a time where you're not, you know, where, where everything is, you know, okay, you're not having any other attention at the time, and you want to give them a copy of your credit report. And you want to say to them, look, I'm giving you a copy of my credit report. Um, and you have to meet it when you say the next thing. I would like to see a copy of yours, and I don't care what's on it. If you betray that trust, I am telling you, you're going to have a lot of problems. It could be the worst report you have ever seen in your life. <laughs> and you laugh, but you don't know. You have to be understanding that this is the person you want to tie the remainder of your life to, that this is part of your life now and you need to plan. This is why you do these things. So you cannot, for any reason, ever bring up what's on that report again for any purposes, especially hurtful ones. But you understand what I'm saying. You need to have, again, an honest dialogue about where you are. And then you start your life together. This is not a reflection of the person. This is a reflection of a situation. This is exactly what I've been talking about. It doesn't mean they're a bad person. It just means there's a situation you need to address, and with your analytical ability, you will address it. Okay, credit scores, they're gonna look at for loans, insurance, car examiners, security plans, employers. Uh, fixing it, you just pay on time. There are certain groups that said, oh yeah, we'll go out, we'll dispute it for you. If you dispute it, and it's not really something you should dispute, what is it when you say something that's not true? How do you pretend it's true? Probably not something as a lawyer. I'm not asking you to respond to that because I'm taking no, uh, <laughs> It's something you shouldn't be doing. Okay, just pay on that. Uh, so okay, we're done. I know everybody's starting at, at the next session, like right at three. If there are questions, I you know where to find me. I'm sitting up in the dais to the people. Um, thank you for coming. I hope this helped. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.